We know you like VRAM, but with the launch of the 9060 XT, we wanted to see how much that stuff really matters by pitting the 8 and 16 gig versions head to head, as well as against Nvidia's closest competitor, the 5060. To do that and give you the most realistic results possible, we built this PC right here, and we'll go through all the parts we decided on for our testing, which we'll also include affiliate links for in the description of the video. Don't forget to watch till the end too, so you can learn how to win this specific PC that we use for our testing. Now, there's this little thing that gamers can't stop debating. It's VRAM. Everyone's been talking about video random access memories because modern games, keep using more and more and GPUs verging on the lower end of the spectrum, like this 8 gig 9060 XT here, well, they're starting to struggle. And that isn't the card's fault. It's more about the optimization of newer games, particularly those either using Unreal Engine 5, developed for consoles first, or both. And another aspect of the argument is we've had eight gigabyte cards for years and nothing's really gotten better. The 3060 gave 12 gigabytes for 329, nearly half a decade ago, and the RX 480 gave eight gigabytes almost 10 years ago for 230 bones. And even though the 480 was on GDDR5, and now the 9060 XT is on six, because of reductions in the memory bus, the 9060 XT's RAM is only 25% faster. And again, nine years later, and for more money, a 26% price increase for no more capacity and 25% boost in speed. At least with Nvidia's nonsense, they can point to the marketing talking point of using GDDR7 and giving nearly half a terabyte of memory speed on their card, a 25% boost in four years and 1.3 times what the GTX 1060 has, which is about when the 480 came out. But how fast the memory is does you no good if you run out of it and are swapping to your system RAM or doing a page file situation. But for those games and situations that are VRAM heavy, what real difference does it make? In the worst case scenario, the game simply won't run. Or if it just requires a little more memory than the GPU has, you'll experience a lower frame rate with a lot more stutters and dropped frames. And in some cases, straight up missing textures. Currently with an eight gig GPU, you can play just about, if not every game on the market. It just won't all be at ultra settings. Of the 20 games we tested for this video, only five had any issues at ultra settings, and by going down to high or medium, you can get rid of most VRAM bottlenecks. We'll go over more of those details in a minute, though. The three graphics cards we're comparing today are the Sapphire Pulse 16 gigabyte, an XFX Swift 8 gig, and a Zotac Amp 5060. I just want to point out the irony that the 16 gig card is tiny in its box format and the 8 gig card is a little chunk. The reason we're putting them up against the 5060 is it has 8 gigabytes of VRAM, is at the same price as the 8 gig 9060 XT, and we had it on hand. Currently still waiting on our 5060 Ti to come in. One of the first things we noticed about the 9060 XTs is they only have three display outputs where the 5060 has four. So if you want to run quadruple monitors, I guess that makes the decision for you because you can do it easily off of the card, but you also have integrated graphics graphics a lot of the time. I don't know. It's a talking point some people use to point out Nvidia is better. And also, no matter what card you get, keep an eye on the outputs because even though both 9060 XTs have three ports, they're split differently. With the Sapphire Pulse having two HDMIs and one display port and the XFX being swapped with two display ports and one HDMI. And while this is really easy to work around, just make sure you know what you're getting and have the appropriate cables to hook up your monitors. For everyone that doesn't have four monitors, Here's more details. For price, both 8 gig cards, Nvidia and AMD, go for right about $300. And you can get the 16 gig 9060 XT for $380. So is the $80 price jump worth it? The short answer is yes. The long answer is also yes, for most people at least. If this is for your main PC and you want it to simply work at the highest settings possible for years to come, go with the extra VRAM because again, the reality is that a lot of modern games are starting to max out eight gigs at ultra settings. If you don't have the extra $80 to spend, the eight gig version is still honestly a great card. Again, just know you won't be able to play everything at ultra and you may be leaving some performance on the table in certain situations. And even if you are planning on upgrading again soon or just using this to flip a PC, it's still a good idea to get the 16 gig version because it is much more widely sought after. And thanks to German retailer Mind Factory who's sharing some sales figures, we can see the 16 outsells the eight gig by almost 
30 times. For the rest of the system specs we use for testing, this pewter here's got a Ryzen 5 9600X and 32 gigabytes of DDR5 5600 RAM from Crucial installed on a gigabyte B850M Gaming X motherboard. For storage, we got a two terabyte Crucial P310 Gen 4 SSD. And to keep the CPU cool, we have a Silverstone Nova P240 AIO. And to power everything here, we have an ASRock Challenger CL 750B PSU that we, we just had on hand from a bundle a while back. And last but certainly not least, the 9060 XTs. And if you're interested in any of the parts we use, be sure to take a look at the affiliate links below. And if you wanna enter into the giveaway for this build or one like it, head on over to our Twitch channel for all the details. We're giving away this PC with the 16 gig card. I think the eight gig's currently installed. We'll, we'll make sure the 16 goes with it. A Razer Blade 18 with a 5090 over on that old twitch.tv forward slash UFD tech page. In case you want a 9070 XT PC, we're giving that away over on twitch.tv forward slash UFD music, where we make music that you can use for your content as well as our own. Now we do want to highlight some aspects of this build in case you're looking to maybe pick up something equivalent for yourself. First, let's talk about the metal and glass box that houses these parts, the Okanos Mirage for, which we were really pleasantly surprised about, especially for the price of this thing. You may not have heard of Okanos, and that's understandable, as they seem to have only been around for about two years, and I had not heard of them uh, before they stopped me in the hall in Taipei while we were at Computex and asked if they could send us a couple cases. But in the two years that they've been around, they've put out an impressive amount of good-looking affordable cases. And while this Mirage 4 was sent to us for review, you can pick it up for only $61. Just don't search for it on Amazon because instead of using its government name of Mirage 4, Okanos decided to go the spammy SEO cramming method of trying to grab anyone who's looking for a budget case. And I have to say, it's Kinda sad they're doing that. It undermines the legitimacy of the company a little bit and makes the case seem like it's gonna be bad, which it's not. I think they could stand on the quality of their product a little bit more than they do. The case has a dual chamber design, supports MATX or ITX motherboards, and has three pre-installed fans, and two of them have reverse blades to give it a really clean look. And to go with the fans, you get an ARGB hub and magnetic mesh filters on both the top and bottom. There's a hard drive tray in the back that can fit one three and a half inch and two two and a half inch drives, and if you need more room or want to show off your SATA SSD, there's a slot in the main chamber for a two and a half inch drive as well. The Mirage 4 can also fit a 240 millimeter radiator up top, as evidenced here, and up to a 325 millimeter long GPU. This thing isn't just good in theory though. The building experience was actually really smooth too. The only thing that stuck out compared to the high-end cases we're used to is the PCIe slot covers. The top two are the regular reusable ones with screws, but the lower three are the one-time use punch-out versions, which is an ideal, but ultimately not a huge deal either. It's a sensible cost-cutting measure. And the dual chamberedness was also nice because as mentioned, the ASRock CL750B PSU has been sitting around for a few months since I picked it up as a combo bundle with a blower style 7900 XTX. And a big reason for us delaying the use is because it isn't modular. But this case gave us the perfect opportunity to use it and just stuff all the extra wires in that back chamber. And while we're talking about the backside here, we actually built this PC just like pretty much all of our other other PCs over on our Twitch channel. We do a segment over there where Kyler does all the cable management. So here's what that looks like. Let us know what you think of it in the comments and give it a rating out of 10 if you want. And if you don't want to, get your dad to do it. He'll know what's up. And now that you're intimately familiar with this little beast, let's talk shop and breakout numbers. A quick note, both 9060 XTs were tested in this 9600X build, but the 5060 was in our main testing rig with an Intel 285K. Realistically, this doesn't make a big difference while gaming because most every game will be GPU bound anyway, but it's just something to keep in mind, especially for the total synthetic benchmarks. Speaking of, we'll put all those results on the screen now. Pause in case you wanna see all of these numbers. Keep in mind, CPU scores are irrelevant here. But for the gaming benchmarks, we'll start by comparing the cards excluding games that take a performance hit due to not having enough VRAM. So. Across 15 games, the Sapphire Pulse, which is the 16 gig card, got an average of 99 FPS. The XFX Swift got 100 FPS and the Zotac 5060 got 95. The reason the eight gig Swift card edged out the Pulse 16 gig is really simple. The Swift had an ever so slightly more aggressive overclock from the factory, giving it an 80 megahertz higher gaming clock and a 12 watt higher power limit. 
But now, let's take a moment to look at the five VRAM constrained games that we left out of those initial averages. First, there's F124. We ran it at ultra settings with ray tracing enabled, and at 1080, it was just barely affecting anything, with the pulse winning by only 1%. But when you go up to 1440p, that gap increases to 32% for the 16 gig card. Or for the worst case scenario, Indiana Jones, it won't even run on Nvidia's eight gigabyte cards at ultra settings. And between the two 9060 XTs at 1080p, the eight gig Swift got 44 FPS, but with double the VRAM, the 16 gig Pulse got over double the FPS at 94. The total averages for the five memory hogging games are 94 FPS for the Pulse, 75 for the Swift, which is a 20% loss, and 61 for the 5060, a 35% loss. Granted, Indiana Jones is by far the biggest memory vampire here, but even if we exclude it and look at the other 19 games, the 16 gig Pulse still beats out the eight gig Swift by 2%, with 98 and 96 FPS respectively, and the 5060 coming in at 10% behind with 88 FPS. If we run the games at medium settings instead of ultra, most of the VRAM issues no longer exist. And by doing that in Indiana Jones, the eight gig 9060 XT goes from getting half the FPS of its 16 gig counterpart to only being behind by 16%. And in Marvel Rivals and F124, where the eight gig was down 15 to 25% with ultra settings, running at medium on average, it ties the 16 gig. So while the eight gig cards do have their drawbacks, they are still very capable and can give you a great gaming experience in case you happen to find it in a pre-build or you get one for a present. And they're good to have as part of the GPU market because while they aren't ideal for everyone, it is nice to have lower end options without resorting to the likes of a 50-50. There is commentary out there on how AMD should have used a different name for the 9060 XT 8 gig, calling it the 9060, and the 16 gig card should have been called the XT. There's validity to that discussion, but it's not of note here simply because we're trying to test the GPUs as they actually exist. And just as a note, these puppies had no problem breathing at all. Both of our cards were able to keep their cool while gaming with the Sapphire Pulse taking 168 watts and staying at 57 degrees Celsius and the XFX Swift pulling 179 watts and staying at 59 degrees. However, NVIDIA still wins on the efficiency front. It takes only 115 watts to be within spitting distance of these cards and average 53 degrees. Part of that's thanks to these reverse fan blades in the Okinos Mirage 4 blowing into the card. Now, overall, we're happy with all the parts we used in this build, but there are still a couple things we would change if we had to do it all over again. First, the power supply, as mentioned, we got this in a bundle with the 7900 XTX a few months ago, and there's nothing wrong with it per se, but if you're buying one that isn't in a bundle, we highly recommend getting a modular one like the Montex Century 2 or Corsair RME, especially if you aren't planning on using a dual chamber case. It'll make the building process so much smoother. And while the 9060 XT doesn't require more than a 450 watt power supply, in our opinion, most people usually stick to 750 watts or more, just because there isn't a huge cost difference. And it's good to have headroom so you can upgrade other components down the line and not have to buy a new PSU and rewire the whole PC. Now we'd also swap out the RAM here too, because while we recommend staying at 32 gigabytes, this set of Crucial Pro is only 5,600 mega transfers and has a cast latency of 46. And there are other sets for only a few bucks more at the 85 to $90 range that offer 6,000 mega transfers and 36 or 30 for the cast latency. We'd probably go with a Team Group T-Create Expert Kit. It would look nice in this entire build. And the CPU and GPU both definitely stay because Nvidia's cheapest 16 gig card is the 5060 Ti, which is 80 to $100 more than the 9060 XT. So around the 1,000 to 12, hundred dollar mark, you can't be in all AMD builds value. But while the CPU stays and we strongly recommend using AM5, you may want to use another motherboard. The Gigabyte B850M Gaming X we used is a nice board overall, but ours had a boot issue that required us to flash the BIOS. It doesn't look like this is a common problem and the board supports Q flash, so it's easy enough to fix, but we still figured we would mention it. And the whole build comes in at $1,168. But if you need to keep it at or under a thousand dollars, we'll put another parts list with what we recommend in the description. And if you're waffling between the eight and 16 gig due to the price, the easiest compromises you can make is to cut the SSD from two terabytes down to one. That should save you about $60, which gets you most of the way there. And it's always easy to add more storage later on. But the fact that you can build this capable of a PC with all new parts right now around a thousand dollars, 
speaks for itself. While we wish modern games in general were a little less VRAM hungry, you can get by with eight gigabytes in most games right now, even with ultra settings. But if games continue trending towards higher VRAM requirements and you want to get the most out of your card to play every game possible without sacrificing quality or having a VRAM bottleneck, the 16 gig version of the 9060 XT is the way to go. Granted, that's a lot of ifs and you may be perfectly content going down to higher medium settings to ease up on the VRAM load. So if you do go with the eight gigabyte card, the 9060 XT still beats the 5060 by five to 10% for the same price, which is great for the budget builders or those who just don't play graphically intensive games. But really, if you can swing it, it's worth the extra $80 to get double the VRAM. It's a minimal percentage increase on the cost of the entire build. The only things to note here is that there's then a software difference that you do have to take into consideration. NVIDIA's DLSS versus AMD's FSR4, CUDA acceleration and various different tasks, or the NVENC encoders that you find in NVIDIA GPUs in case you're thinking of streaming, those are entirely different separate work cases that we just didn't cover here. This is purely from a gaming uh, raw numbers and evaluation of these cards. And the problem with all of our statements here is we're in a worse place than we were in 2016. For $199, you got a four gig 4080 option, or for $230, you could double it to eight gigs. That's a significantly discounted price compared to what's on offer from AMD today. You have to pay a lot more to go above what was provided for budget gamers nine years ago. Now we've come a long way in terms of raw gaming performance, that's true, and I don't want to dismiss the engineering achievement to create faster and faster cards every year, but it sure does seem like AMD and Nvidia are cheaping out when it comes to giving RAM to the masses. AMD's made the argument that there are plenty of people who don't need more than eight gigs, since the most played games are old school and esports ones, Minecraft, CS2, Dota, all games that don't require a significant boost above integrated graphics to run. But I think with that argument from AMD, the best solution would be for them to offer a single low-end esports focus card like the 9060 at a discounted rate and all these other dedicated GPUs need to be more beefy in the VRAM department. Give a 9060 XT 12 gigabyte with 192 bit bus, 9070 XT with 24 to 32 gigs. It appears that with the AI boom though, they're just going to charge as much as possible for every boost in VRAM since they can. People will buy the AI Pro R9700 with 32 gigs at $1,400 or they will spend the extra 80 bones to get the 16 gig 9060 XT. And because consumers are willing to spend that much, they're going to keep pushing the price as high as they can. They're a publicly traded company. It's their birthright and destiny.